Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 243 with Alex Benayan. Some of my favorite parts of this episode were when he shares his story about hacking the game show The Price is Right to where he is today. It is such an epic story. I also loved it when he shares the three biggest lessons from the world's most successful celebrities and where he tells us what Jessica Alba taught him and how it changed his life. But there is so much more wisdom, knowledge, and inspiration that you get in the full episode. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head on over to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 243 right now. Alex, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you here today. Now, I am so excited for this conversation (laughs) because I loved your book. I read it in four days. I couldn't put it down. I was on the edge of my seat. Can you take us back to the day before your freshman year final exams? (laughs) Yeah. So I was 18 years old. And I was going through this life crisis. I, you know, to understand why I was going through it, you have to understand that I'm the son of Persian Jewish immigrants in America, which essentially means I came out of the womb. My mom cradled me in her arms and then she stamped MD on my ass and just sent me on my way. (laughs) And, you know, you think it's funny, but in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween and thought I was cool. (laughs) That was my childhood. No. (laughs) And... You know, in high school, I checked all the boxes. I studied for the SATs. I took all the biology classes. I went to pre-med summer camp. And by the time I got to college, I was the pre-med of pre-meds. But very quickly, I found myself on my dorm room bed looking at this towering stack of biology books, feeling like it was sucking the life out of me. And at first, I assumed I was just being lazy. But very quickly, I began to wonder, maybe I'm not on my path. So now not only did I not know what I wanted to do with my life, I had no idea how the people who I looked up to, how they did it. You know, how did Bill Gates sell his first piece of software out of his dorm room when nobody knew his name? Or how did Lady Gaga get her first record deal without a single hit under her belt? You know, this is what they don't teach you in school. So I just assumed there had to be a book with the answers. So I'm, you know, ripping through biographies and self-help book, assuming there had to be a book with the answers. But very quickly, I found myself left empty-handed. And that's when my naive 18 year thinking kicked in. I thought, well, no one's written the book I'm dreaming of reading. Why not write it myself? You know, I thought it'd be super simple. I would just call up Bill Gates, interview him, interview everybody else. And I thought it'd be done in a few months. That I assumed would be the easy part. The hard part I figured was getting the money to fund this journey. You know, I was buried in student loan debt. I was all out of bar mitzvah cash. So there had to be a way to make some quick money. At this point now, it's the night before my freshman year final exams. And I'm in the library doing what everyone's doing in the library right before finals. I'm on Facebook. And I I see someone offering free tickets to the price is right. And I was going to school in Los Angeles, not too far from where the show filmed. And my first thought was, what if I go on the show and win some money to fund this book? You know, not my brightest moment. Plus, I had a problem. I'd never seen a full episode of the show before. So I told myself it was a dumb idea to not think about it. But I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments where an idea just keeps clawing itself back into your mind, no matter how, you know, idiotic it is. So I decided that night to do the logical thing and pull an all-nighter to study. As you do. But I didn't study for finals. I said how to hack the Price is Right. And I went on the show the next day and I executed this, you know, preposterous strategy and I ended up winning the whole final prize, winning a sailboat, selling the sailboat. And that's how I funded the book. And from there, that's how the journey took off. It took two years to track down Bill Gates. It took three years to track down Lady Gaga. And when I started the journey, there was no part of me looking for that, you know, quote unquote, one key to success. But what ended up happening over these seven years is I realized every single person I talked to, it didn't matter if it was, you know, Larry King or Jessica Alba, Steve Wozniak, they all treated life and business success the exact same way. And the analogy that came to me is that 
it's sort of like getting into a nightclub. There's always three ways in. So there's the first door at the main entrance where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people wait around hoping to get in. You know, that's the first door. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and celebrities go. And for some reason, school and society have this way of making us feel like those are the only two ways in. You either wait your turn or you're born into it. But what I learned is that there's always, always the third door. And it's the entrance where you jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen. There's always a way in. You know, getting every interview was its own adventure. So for Larry King, I chased him through a grocery store. You know, for every, you know, with Steven Spielberg, I almost died in the south of France, you know, chasing him on his yacht. So every, you know, story is its own adventure with Warren Buffett. It was this eight month quest where I ended up hacking his shareholders meeting. So every story was its own adventure. And in many ways, not only were the lessons that I learned in the interviews life changing, you know, with Bill Gates, we talked about his negotiating secrets and his sales secrets. You know, with Larry King, we talked about his secret to interviewing. Not only were the lessons I learned in the interviews life-changing, so were the journeys to get to each interview. Because many times it was my mistakes and my failures that taught me the most. What are the top three biggest things that you learned from all of these incredible people that you interviewed? Like, what are the three biggest things and some of the most common things that they all had? You know, it was very natural when I started writing The Third Door, I was completely consumed by fear. And at the same point, I was just really paralyzed by fear the whole way through. So of course, when I was going to interview all these people, a natural question for me was, how did they become so fearless? If you look at Bill Gates or Elon Musk, they had to have been fearless or else, how else, they would, have, how else would they have achieved what they did, right? And... When I went to go do the interviews, I was completely surprised by the answers because what I learned is that not only were every single one of these people scared in the beginning, but they were also completely terrified the whole way through. And that didn't make any sense to me. And what I learned is that it wasn't fearlessness they achieved. It was courage. And while the words sound very similar, the difference is critical. You know, fearlessness is jumping off the cliff and not thinking about it. You know, that's idiotic. Courage, on the other hand, is acknowledging your fear, analyzing the consequences, and then deciding you care so much about it, you're still going to take one thoughtful step forward anyway. So that's been something that really changed me. Another thing that changed me came from my interview with Quincy Jones, where I really learned more about the relationship between success and failure. And I had always assumed the opposite of success is failure. But it wasn't until that interview with Quincy Jones that I realized that success and failure actually aren't opposites. They're just different results of the same thing. So the opposite of success isn't failure. The opposite of success is not trying. And a third thing that, you know, of course, came to me throughout the journey is... Many times, and you know, you'll appreciate this since you, you know, read the book already. Life will keep hitting you over the head with the same lessons until you listen. And while there's, you know, a lot of, you know, practical tools and lessons from all the different interviews, if I had to zoom out and look at one of the big themes, it's that life will just keep hitting you over the head with the same lesson until you listen. And thankfully on this journey, halfway through, I started to listen. Which interview surprised you the most? I would say it was probably the interview with Jessica Alba. What she didn't know when I was going into this interview is my dad had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer a few weeks earlier. When I went into the interview, I decided I really wanted it to, you know, stay positive, you know, just focus on Jessica Alba. And I asked her, you know, a question that I thought would just make this the most positive interview. I was like, you know, what is the best lesson your mom ever taught you? I thought that would be like a good warm-up question. And she sits back in her chair. She goes, well, my mom taught me to appreciate every moment you have with your parent because you never know when it's going to be the last. And I was literally like, I felt like I got punched in the gut. 
And, you know, Jessica Alba like keeps going on. She's like, you know, I learned from my mom to, you know, really appreciate every, you know, second you have with your parent, you know, no matter what. And, you know, she just kept going on. She's like, you know, you never know when life is going to be over in a snap. And I literally was in so much pain. I like had to change the subject. So I asked her another question that I knew what the answer would be. I asked her, I'm like, how'd you start the honest company? Because, you know, I've heard her answer that question a dozen times in different interviews. And it's always a very positive, uplifting story. And this time she, for some reason, goes, I was thinking about death. And she went on to explain how when she was pregnant with her first daughter, she was realizing if life can come into this world so easily, it can leave so easily. So she wanted to create products that lead to healthy, healthier and happier lives. And it was so painful hearing Jessica Alba talk about how cancer has such a deep history in her family. And literally, she just kept talking about death and cancer, death and cancer, until literally I just blurted out, you know, my dad has pancreatic cancer. Normally, when I would share that with people, you know, they would lower their voice and you know, say, I'm so sorry. Jessica Alba, for some reason, did the opposite. She like slapped her hand on the couch and she was like, fuck. And it felt like she was lifting a weight off my shoulders I didn't even know existed. And from that point on, it was no longer an interview. Who out of all of the people besides that story inspired you the most, like inspired you in your business? By far the least known person in the book, in my opinion, is one of the coolest, and his name is Chi Lu. And Chi Lu grew up in a rural village outside of Shanghai, China, with no running water and no electricity. People were so impoverished that people walked around with deformities for malnutrition. And, you know, Chi Lu was really smart and, you know, he worked really hard his whole life and, you know, got into college and by age 27 was making the most money he's ever made in his life. Seven dollars a month. And then fast forward 20 years later and he's a president at Microsoft. And it's one of the most remarkable stories that is never talked about in Silicon Valley. And it's honestly a testament to what's possible. Throughout the book, you continue to get knocked down. So how did you get back up and keep going? What I've learned is that, you know, if you open Instagram, there's like a million people yelling at you to, you know, keep going, keep pushing, keep going. And what I've learned is that it can be really brutal, especially when you're starting something new. It doesn't matter if you're starting a business, writing a book, starting a new role at your company, you know, starting anything new. It can be extremely painful. And the biggest thing when I've been the most burnt out, when I've been completely on the floor, just completely dejected, the biggest thing that saved me and it's like the most counterintuitive advice in like 2019 is to take a fucking break. Yes. There are times where you will be so dejected where if you just push through, you will just harden and harden and harden to the point where you'll forget why you even started in the first place. Now, you've had a lot of success with this book. So, and everyone's definition of success is different. But what do you attribute your success to? I've realized that a lot of people in life, you know, they might have their eyes open, but they're not looking. Mm. You know, they might be listening, but they're not hearing. And if I had to attribute, you know, where I am in life to one thing, It would be somehow mustering the courage to no matter how scary or painful it might be to look, to keep looking. Now, what's your mission? What's the mission moving forward? If I've learned one thing over the past seven years, it's that you can give someone all the best tools and tactics in the world and their life can still feel stuck. But if you change what someone believes is possible, they'll never be the same. Young people will always reach for the highest branch they believe is possible. 
they will always reach for the highest branch they believe is possible. So it's our jobs, whether it's school or society or you know the media at large, to illuminate more branches. And that's the mission moving forward. If you could put one book in the school curriculum of every high school around mm. the world, what is one book that you would choose? Just one. When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. And it's a book that has changed my life tremendously. And it's a book about exactly what the title says, when things fall apart. When life completely unravels, helps you, this book shows you, it almost like reprogrammed the way I live. Because the way I viewed the world when my life was falling apart was unmanageable. And this book became my guide of how to view what was going on around me and how Mm. I could heal. What are you working on or would like to improve within yourself at the moment? So with the book coming out and with, you know, like I mentioned, hard times, you know, family wise, I've really been focusing on like my mental and emotional health. Uh, you know, going to therapy every week, you know, journaling, going to, you know, different support groups. But I do feel like I want to start putting some energy into my physical health, which I used to do a lot of, uh, but I want to put more energy into that. And another thing that I've been aware of, and I'm doing better at it, is not comparing my journey to anyone else's. Because mm. it's very easy to, you know, go on Instagram right before bed and open it up and see someone else who's sold more books than you or does a different, you know, there's a million other things that you can compare yourself to. And to me, it just creates this like spiral of like, I'm not enough. And it just keeps going and going and going. And it becomes like harder to pull myself out. So it's something I'm trying to bring awareness to. So I love hearing about how people's days look and how people set themselves up for the day. Like, do you have a morning routine? How do you prime yourself for the day so that you set yourself up for a successful day? Now that it's more like book tour schedule, it's a bit chaotic because it's like sometimes I'm waking up at 4 a.m. to catch a flight. Sometimes, you know, I'm in a city in between gigs and I have a full day to myself. So like every day is a little different. The one thing that I do have in common every day is I do meditate once in the morning, once in the afternoon, so twice a day for 20 minutes, and I do transcendental meditation. And, you know, I didn't do it for, like, spiritual reasons in the beginning. I did it literally because, like, Oprah Winfrey does this thing called transcendental meditation. Ray Dalio does this thing called transcendental meditation. Jerry Seinfeld started this thing called transcendental meditation and swears by it. Ellen DeGeneres. it, It started getting to the point of, like, Like literally just like out of like curiosity and it completely changed my life. So I'd love to hear now, in the book, you share a story about your dad, but you haven't shared that here with us today. I'd love to, I'd love for you to share that story with us. My dad two years ago passed away and yeah, it was by far one of the most, you know, painful and sad times in my life. I'm really, at the same time, too, my sisters stepped up in ways I've never seen them step up before. My mom, you know, I saw sides of her I didn't even know existed. And while I am grateful to have that last year with my dad, it definitely wasn't easy. It was by far, you know, one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. And it felt like I was able to see sort of the ending of life towards the beginning of mine. You know, I was only, Mm -hmm. you know, 24 years old and it taught me a lot, you know, a chaplain who I met, his name is Chaplain Kevin, and he really guided my family through this process towards the end. He has this great quote that says, you know, the way you die, uh, you die the way you live. You die the way you live. and you know, some people on their deathbed are peaceful. Some people are angry. Some people are resentful. Some people are communicative. Some people are not communicative, you know, and people are always like, why are they acting this way? And the truth is, that, you know, you die the way you live. And the inverse of that is true too. So 
if you want to die peacefully, then you should probably be a bit more thoughtful about living peacefully too.